from this computer and superstition. And if you get the feeling that you're the only non-believer in your town, well, you're just not. In Knoxville, in the middle of the Bible Belt, we have a group of over a thousand of us. And we'll tell you more about that group after the mid-show break. Wombat, well, what's our topic today? we got a number of topics today. We're talking about the universe and karma. Do atheists threaten Christianity? And then, of course, my personal favorite, science says that atheists are more unhappy than Christians. And let's talk about the validity <laughs> of those studies. But before we get into the meat and potatoes, we're going to throw it up to our own noodly priester in practice to lead us in our weekly invocation. Our noodly Lord, who art in a colander, al Dante be thy noodles. Thy blood be rum, thy sauce be yum with meat as it is with vegetables. Give us this day our garlic bread and forgive us our cussing as we forgive those who cuss against us. And lead us not into ketoism, but deliver us some grog. <laughs> For thine are, the, are, thine are the noodles and the sauces and the grog whenever and ever. Wrong. What happened there? What happened there? What happened there? <laughs> a brain fart. I think it was karma. I think it was karma. Oh, speaking thought, of karma, why don't you tell us about it? I thought it was a fake glitch. Ah, yeah. <laughs> it was a glitch in the matrix. There you go. There you go. Yes. Yeah. So speaking of karma, Dred, what, what do you mean by that? What are you talking about? Yeah, well, you know, I, I find it interesting in talking with people who don't identify either as religious or even spiritual in some some cases. Hmm. Who still say things like, well, you know, if it's meant to be, or, you know, uh, you know, hopefully uh, karma is going to get them for, you know, their bad deeds and all that right. kind of stuff. What goes around comes around. What mm. goes around comes around. Exactly. Yeah. And I find them, you know, for the most part in even SE discussions like street epistemology or Socratic examination, that people come to realize that they don't really they haven't really given that a lot of thought in in many cases right um but uh you know of course you have to think about what would have to be true about the nature of the universe for karma to to exist at all sure um, if there's no god or you know if there's no background designer who would be keeping a record of all this stuff and how would it be recorded in you know the the background like would it be recorded in the cosmic background radiation somehow mm -hmm. but uh I, th I thought it intriguing because i i've always you know kind of wondered because i used to i used to say that too i used to believe in karma when um, you, when you believed in karma what is what specifically was it that you believed in was it just a vague sense of justice or a meticulous detail of actions by every person and weighing and balancing of it or was it something yeah. else yeah, yeah, something, something like a weighing and balancing that there was, you know, a ledger, you know, in some respects, like, um, you know, the more good deeds I did, you know, hopefully it would come back on me and, you know, I might win the lottery or something like, like that. Like the you know? Egyptian gods used <clears throat> to weigh, weigh the soul of the, the soul against the, against the feather. You guys, yeah. you, so we just had a, uh, uh, I don't know if it was on HBO, it was on Disney Plus, there was a show called Moon Knight. I don't know if you guys have been hearing about that, but. No. I, Egypt, Egyptian gods are very popular right now, at least uh, in the uh, zeitgeist of, you know, young adults. And one of the things that people are now being more aware of is that this is not a new concept, that gods who weigh uh, good deeds versus bad deeds, even on literal balances, have it's been a concept that has existed. I would say back when uh, people were worshiping animals all the way to like these Judaic, you know, practice beliefs. And I would say like, because it's not novel, I think it'd be possible to actually envision that universe where you don't necessarily have, you know, our classic gods, but perhaps this vague sense of justice in the universe that's keeping track of everyone. The only thing I don't know is what would that universe explicitly look like? Dred, do you have ideas? Yeah, I, I, I mean, now that I'm not ensconced in that sort of belief system, mm -hmm. I, uh, I find it hard to even appreciate what was going through my head when when uh when i did believe it um and i guess it's you know sort of a it really comes down to magical thinking mm. uh, this idea and that, indoctrination uh, well it, yeah certainly indoctrination because i was raised catholic um but then i 
I certainly, after leaving Catholicism, you know, s- sort of uh, stayed on a spiritual path. The Egyptian gods were a big thing, hermetic uh, magic and all that kind of stuff. Oh, nice. Yeah, and I, and I did that for, actually, I did that for a lot longer than it was certainly any useful purpose for, other than, uh, you know, sort of the social group. But also, uh, it's all, it, it really does come down to magical thinking, I think, and, and uh, just strange beliefs. Alita, you have something to say? They changed that name. <laughs> um, no, uh, what gets me is that most of this um, karma belief uh, is founded on something we hardly even think about it anymore as a society, and that's souls. Oh, I right. mean, if you don't have a soul, you're not going to be <clears throat> judged right or wrong or whatever in the afterlife because there is no left afterlife. And if there's no souls, how many religions would just go away if they, we found that we could prove that souls don't exist? And there's never been any good evidence that they do exist, any evidence at all, except for you know, ghost stories and anecdotal evidence, that type of thing. But to uh, karma, I mean, if karma did exist, <laughs> could it not exist in the absence of a soul? Because you're, you're getting, um, you know, karma is happening to you all well, the you're time. T- you're you know, talking you about just, in this world? Yes. Yeah, in this well, world. So if you do yeah. something bad, version. well, that's going to come back well, at you. It, it begs the question, how long can you do something bad before it catches up? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> look at how, how long Hitler did it. You know, you would think that if karma was real, he, after he killed the first couple of people, he would die. Right. Uh, that's what a, a real, uh, universe with actual karma, quick, quick karma, uh, would look like. Uh, and John. he went on and had finally had we had to catch him and kill him ourselves, or at least get to that point yeah. before what he was doing stopped. Well, well, here's a good question too: Like, could the Large Hadron Collider find the karma particle or the karma, <laughs> the karma <laughs> field? In which oh. karma manifests as, you know, a how would we particle? recognize it? <laughs> I mean, we found the God particle, but that's only because a scientist named it that. Right. right. Not right. that it had anything right. to do with the God. Right. 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 Of course. John, love to get your feedback here. Yeah, sure. Well, do you have karma, karma chameleon? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's 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 the, the the karma particle. It's chameleon shaped. I thought it was just comedians, but okay. <laughs> what I wonder is people only seem to wish for karma when, they've, when they're disgruntled, when they feel that they've had a bad deal and they're looking for some compensation in the future. Yes. Do they never do it the other way around? I mean, right. do they never think, I've done a lot of good now, let's have some bad to balance it up. <laughs> you know, and actually, I, I get... I hear people say you know like uh, about lottery tickets and stuff like if they win a lottery ticket like 400 bucks on a scratch and win or something they say oh well i must have good karma you know Mm -hmm. like attributing it to a magical uh a a magical yeah quote or i must be living right right john john i I agree after they spent 800 dollars to get it right Mm -hmm. john i see your point it's like karma exists for people to fill in the gaps of an imperfect justice system yeah yeah and, and i wonder and then, i was gonna say i wonder what the criteria are i mean how mm-hmm. how do you decide whether you've had what you've had was bad enough to deserve a bit of good i mean mm-hmm. what what's the measurement here mm-hmm. one comment before we get to george i just wanted to throw in when we were talking about hitler it does karma does provide this really unusual scary point of view where it's like well then the jews must have deserved it if karma exists because karma knows how to equitably distribute justice to everyone Mm -hmm. and that is a really scary you know pov in my opinion and the Mm -hmm. second one is if if you win the lottery or if you do something terrible let's say it's not something as 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 not offensive as winning the lottery but like you stole you robbed the bank and you got away with it you can look at that karmically speaking and say, well, I deserve to have the money and, 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 and get away scot-free because karma is on my side. It's like this really unusual tool to make empathy an alternative mental action when it should not have yeah. any inhibition whatsoever. Um, George... I, I still want to know what the metric yeah. is. Yes. Well, it's, it's just like, it's exactly like the God thing. I mean, when, when you're 
when your football team wins, yeah, you you, you say God made my football team win. Yep. When your football team loses, you say God works in mysterious <laughs> ways. <laughs> It's the same with the karma. You say, yeah. "God damn it!" <laughs> you don't. You don't say it's about time we had a lose now, do you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Alita, what do you think? I uh, that ain't Mr. Larry. <laughs> I, I forgot to change it on my my screen. Anyway, I'll change it here in a second. I got um, you. No, when somebody uh, say they get they hit they're in a fiery car accident and like three people die, but you didn't, you know, right? Say, you know, uh, well, I prayed or I'm a good Christian, inferring that the other people had it coming. You know, there's right. some built in karma in that type of uh, stance, yeah, were. yeah. And if anything, it's a system that makes life scarily easier for people who don't want to think about nuances or complex systems. So, like, if justice fails. You can think, oh, well, karmically, that murder will finally get retribution somewhere down the road. Uh -huh. We don't have to fix this problem. Karma's got it. It's like, that's a bad, simplistic point of view. And if Absolutely. there's someone who gets you know, like their house burned down, it's like, ah, yeah. karma will fix it. Don't worry about it. I don't have yeah. to you know, help this neighbor of mine or right. learn from their folly. It's just mm -hmm. the universe will take care of it and I'm good. Yeah. And, and unless you go downtown and look at all the cold cases. Files, yes, exactly. You know, people that don't get caught. Right, right, right. And it's just, uh, in my head, permission to not think critically what I see when I see karma. And I wish they would be recognized for that, for what it is. And, and more along the lines of embrace the mystery of a universe that isn't, you know, tied together, that is very much has a lot of loose ends to it. And then realize that there's a uh, potential for, I guess, servicing accountability like hey this is a this is somewhat of a random universe but i don't have to treat myself or other people randomly i can i can feel actualized by coming up with systems and behavior and character that make my actions uh representative of a good way of behaving in a in a chaotic universe and if i can set up a good model that inspires other people to behave and treat other people equitably the all the better for society in in a universe that doesn't necessarily have our best interests at heart and i think that tends to be something that gives me purpose and accountability and reason to wake up and, and try harder the next day, even when I do you know, fail and, and want to move. Personally, I, I believe the universe doesn't care at all. No, the universe <laughs> is trying to kill us, by the way. The, yeah. it, the sun yeah. is out there being like, why aren't you dead yet? Yeah. UV radiation. Hey, and John, the cold. <laughs> yeah. John, what's up? <clears throat> oh, you're mute, my buddy. You know how in, in some games you have a rating against your name so that you, you're a a triple scorer or whatever. Sure. Uh -huh. If there was such a thing as karma, as karma then mm. the universe, we'd have a little thermometer beside us and, sure. and it would go up as, as we got to the level of deserving karma. And oh. then suddenly, suddenly we'd get some karma and it would go back to zero. Okay. I would, so in a universe, so we were talking about what would the universe need to look like in order for us to believe that karma exists. I would like to see something like that. Just like a little meter that's next to everyone's head that goes up or green or red. And like, yes. there's a range, there's like a little yellow bar on either side. And yes. if it crosses that line, you're going to get some karma. But if you yes. go back down again, it's like normal. So like everyone's trying to do their best, to like push it up to green and like get good rewards. And I think that could actually curb society in a good way. Just immediate feedback on the actions that we do. That's just a literal guideline of like, this is a good thing. That's a bad thing. Do the good things. It's good for everybody. Yes. But we don't have I'd that. call that a karmaometer. Karmometer. Yes, like karmometer. Yeah. I was thinking that uh, you know, there's there's probably a million dollar idea right there is coming up with a, a device that just reads, you know, some random backfield magnetic yes. field or whatever, and, and people carry it along and that's their karmometer. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's like a radiation thing, you know. You yeah, go, but, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. What if you're like Genghis Khan or Hitler or somebody? How high do you do you set that? I mean, what's your range on them? Yeah. So I think that is it, basically. Just make it scientific, like make mm -hmm. the measuring of karma scientific and visible to everyone. And then we believe it exists, something that's testable and recordable and that can be measured through repeatable tests that are objective across different people. Then we have a very strict guideline on what we can do to increase our karma what we can do to get our cosmic justice, what we can do to get our cosmic rewards. And I think if we had that, we wouldn't have a complaint that we're getting them or being punished by them because now we have a guide of what it takes to get your or, and we'd be totally well, you, fine with that. You, you can take the next step instead of just putting a gauge next to the person, 
have some kind of shock uh, come from it. You know, uh, built in. Uh, Larry going uh, straight to the, <laughs> the, the, the scary route. Built now. in retribution. This is why we can't have nice the aggressor. I'm also going to say this too. Hey, there might be, if we do have gauges, right? Uh, maybe there could be like some sort of, um, if it was like a thing that you buy at a store and put on your shoulder, or like on your neck, that'd suck. But I would, I was preferring like someone just left something over my head, just like spiritually or <laughs> heavenly. Like, like your health bar. Yeah. Or just like some sort of visual indicator of like, hey, this yeah. guy is doing good. This a halo not. that gets bigger and bigger and pulses. A halo, yeah. Or horns. <laughs> I don't want to give Christians any head starts and saying that they're right all along. I was thinking more of like the life bar or horns. I like horns. They're cool. The cool you are, the bigger your horns are. I love that. I always said we should have had horns. Yeah. yeah. You, you know I'd that like, guy. I'd be like a moose. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> you, you know that guy who sold a load of fake mine detectors? He sold them to governments. Oh, wow. This, yeah. Yeah, and then I wanted, forget what. That's the it had nothing in it. You know, it was mm-hmm. just a gadget. Black and, and, box. Yeah, and as as people as people went into the airport or whatever, they were te- tested by this gadget, which produced no results at all. But he made a fortune. Let's mm-hmm. tell him this is his next project. Okay, he's in sure. jail. Of course, he's in jail now. <laughs> now, I'm going to throw something out because we still have like about eight minutes before the half. But ew, do we not have systems like that already in place? And I'm going to I'm going to take a wild step into the beyond here, but I'm thinking like social media has sort of become sort of that litmus of good standing among people and immediate feedback from peers or even an audience in terms of whether Mm. this person is Mm. a person of character or not Mm. a person of character. Mm. However, the judgment system tends to be. Uh, more stark. John, sounds like you have something. Yeah, I, I love that idea. And, and it happened only a few days ago. Hmm. We were in a situation, I was driving my daughter to school, okay. and we were in a situation where there are two lanes, one turns right, and one, the other one turns left, or goes straight on. And the, the right-hand one is popular, so there's a half a mile of tailback. So what people do is they steam up the left one, and then try and sneak in between you so that when the lights go green, they save themselves a lot of time. Hmm. We, did, we did the very thing you're thinking here. We, we insisted on public justice. We kept our cars so close together. This ah. poor guy, this poor guy who'd steamed up to, on the left-hand side couldn't get in and he had to wait there for the next red cycle to go through. Mm. Which, yes. That was, that no, was that public power. Karma. Yeah. Right, right, right. Even when I was in school, we would have some before social media existed. We, I would be like, I would only allow people to cut into line if I was the last person in line because I only wanted it to affect me. But it always made me upset when people in front of me, like way in front of me, would let their friends cut in because it affected yeah. not just them, but everyone behind them. And yes, I'm like, exactly. what are you doing down there? I think only the person at the back has the right to do that. Yes. So, like, I feel like there are, I feel like we have some social mechanisms in place. Maybe not as digitalized as what social media does, but that does help us remember what character looks like. And we can come up with like a social sort of like reaction to that. Dread, what do you think? Public justice. Public justice. I I think that uh, social media, though, um, is often driven by um, kind of populism, right? Mm. Right. And if if you, it's harder to voice an um, an unpopular opinion and be canceled for it uh, often quite stridently by you know a group of people who are quick to be vocal and self-righteous and all the rest of it mm-hmm. so it's not really a good a barometer uh, for yeah. the quality of character it's sure. just whoever yells the loudest and uh, right you know, one has to place for discourse yet only yeah. take a look at the number of followers trump has yeah, yeah, right, to right, see right. that there's a flaw in the system mm-hmm. right you know, it's uh, there's it's similar to how people will reach out to karma as a salve to a broken justice system. A lot of people reach out to loud voices that just seem confident as mm-hmm. a salve to their own lacking self esteem, and they yeah. and they grip onto you know loud, powerful voices even when they're completely objectively wrong because in them they have recompense for their lack of you know value that they see in themselves they see value right. in other people as it's a, an, as a, it's, a it's a ready auto um amplification yeah of, of their own feelings without having to be 
necessarily that loud themselves. Right. And likewise, you know, it's hard to get an education. Let's just, I'm just going to be flat out. Like working out, it's difficult. Working out your brain, also difficult. They're both, they both take time and effort to like ratchet your way up. But the thing is muscles you can see, but smart you can't. So you always have the impression when you see a guy who's really muscular, like, oh, well, I'm not as strong as him, but I'm definitely smarter than these PhDs. I'm smarter than these professors. I'm smarter than these guys who are telling me what I should do and what I shouldn't do. I don't like that. It's like, maybe you're not, but that's not a popular opinion to like exp to expound upon. And so as a result, there's like this very stark anti-intellectualism, anti even when the, the matter that intellectuals are proposing are in the best interest of all of humanity, climate change. Right. Uh, right, true. civil rights, so many different Actually. things. The list just goes on. I don't have to go over it here. But that is why I find a lot of people who are looking for a loud voice to, to feel self-esteem, to fill in their self-esteem for, typically go the anti-intellectual route, typically go the route that is anti-science and like hold on to this more conservative ideology that, or one that's more closed-minded, even on the liberal side, where it's just like, I don't care about these other opinions. I don't care about other discourse. I just want to listen to this one person who's perhaps saying something that's absolutely harmful to society at large. It's very unfortunate. And I think we break out of that by it just empowering people to think critically on their own and giving them the opportunity to be educated and maybe even skewing our education practices to enable better critical thought practices. Because right now we just teach kids out of books or, or, you know, like list of rules to remember, or, or, you know, answers in the back of, you know, texts, like, let's let them think about problem solving and let them go empower them to do it on their own. Yeah. John. I, I thought we all imagined that we were always the smartest person in whichever room, or is it just me? <laughs> <laughs> George, what are you doing there? Well, I, I think that we are in a period now when uh, anti-expertise anti is on the ascendant. I love that. And um, I, I see different signs of it here and there. I mean, at least in the society that I'm looking at here in the United States, I, I can't talk about elsewhere in the world. There, there do, do seem to be places, different places in the world where authoritarianism is, is the rule that I wasn't aware of before. I, I don't know about anti-expert, anti-expert sentiment. Well, what is it? It's a lack of, lack of trust in institutions. Mm, that too. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and some of it even rightly deserved, I would say, but like also Dunger Kruger effect. What do you think about that? Yeah, Dred? Yeah. Do you think that falls yeah. into it? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No question. What is this effect you're talking about, Kruger? Right. What? The Kruger-Dunning effect is where um, you believe that you are smarter than you are, essentially. <laughs> you have greater expertise in a subject, which you certainly don't. Well, the less it's, you know about something, the more you think you know about it. And the reverse is also true. There are people who are uh, highly educated who underestimate their ability yeah. in certain mm. subjects. Um, but it's, it, Dunning Kruger is a bit more than that because it's not having the ability to understand what you, how much you don't know. Yes. Right, that's right. it. Well, that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. nutshell. And the more you get that understanding through actually understanding it, the more you realize that there's so much more to not understand. And so yes. it, it humbles you in a <laughs> weird way. Sometimes, at least that's what it should. And yeah. and well, for those who don't have it, it's just a gross overestimation of what they're capable of doing. Yeah. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you can't learn it. Just be aware and, of that. And this is a good way to, uh, I mean, in uh, street epistemology is, is the calibration is to uh, find out what, to what degree a person is confident in their belief about yeah. something. And if someone's a hundred percent or comes off as a hundred percent, you already know that mm. there's a bit of the Dunning Kruger effect in there Absolutely. because, um, you know, I had someone talk about uh, in Canada here, the freedom truckers, thing of in the anti-vax movement or anti-mandate movement and they said you know i'm 100 percent confident that what i believe is true i have doctors and scientists who agree and i pointed out that a doctor and a scientist would never uh well in the majority of cases would never say that they're 100 percent confident in anything because the nature of science and medicine and all the rest is that it's a it's a matter of discovery and 
you could be 99%, but you always reserve right. a, a level of um, uncertainty in order mm. for you to change your mind when the facts change. This is all provisional. It's all provisional, exactly. Man, I could talk about confidence all day. How much time do we got, Larry? Are we really at that break right now? We're pretty much at the break. Um, okay, okay. I guess okay. we're... Uh, stay tuned right here for the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. We're on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we'll be right back after this short break. Mm. Welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I'm Daughter Five, and we're on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Let's take a moment to talk about the Atheist Society of Knoxville. ASK was founded in 2002, and we're in our 20th year. ASK has over 1,000 members, and we have weekly in-person meetings in Knoxville's Old City at Barley's Tap Room and Pizzeria. Look for us inside at the high top table or outside on the patio if the weather is nice. We're usually the loudest, happiest group there. We also have Tuesday evening Zoom meetups. If you'd like to join us, email us at askanatheist at knoxvilleatheist.org or let's chat se at gmail.com. Uh, you can also find us online at on Facebook, meetup.com, or at the website knoxvilleatheist.org, or you can just Google Knoxville Atheist. It's just that simple. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to Meetup and do a search for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one? Start, Start one. one. And Wombat, where do you want to pick up? Yo, I want to talk about confidence real quick before we get into the next topic, because it was a really interesting um, tangent. In our lab, we do the statistical tests to verify if a series of numbers that we get from an instrument are in control, if they're within an acceptable range of tolerance, or are they yeah. out of control. We don't just eyeball it and say, oh, these numbers look fairly similar to each other. We're good to go. Or have so faith the test in it. <laughs> it will have faith in it. Faith doesn't go very far, though there are religious people in our group, but they use our scientific methods when it comes to their scientific processes, right. and that should be telling to you. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the two tests that we do is called a T-test and an, a Fisher's test. And the T-test basically collates a bunch of numbers together and says, here's your score. And you can take that score and you can plug it into an A-test or a Fisher's test, and it'll basically tell you if you can be 95% confident about it or not 95% confident about it about it being different or an outstanding outlier in that set of numbers. But the cool thing is, is why do we only stick to 95% confidence? You could actually skew your Fisher scale so that you could be 99.99999% confident or even 100% confident. However, it tends to be the case that people who skew their information that way only invite more skepticism at the result. If someone's yeah. even more than 95% confident after doing an A test, people will look at the number of tests they did. It's like, you're 100% confident that you're right, but you only did four tests. You should be doing thousands upon thousands. Right. No wonder your confidence is so high. You didn't do enough of a thorough study. Yeah, so it's a lot of people hacking, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of people. Yeah. So a lot of people will just be like, 95 is the highest in terms of confidence I can get, which is a fairly confident value. I could still be wrong, but there's always room for that. And so in scientific circles, 95% is typically the highest you get. So you don't really find a skilled statistician or even like a, a well-versed scientist or a doctor who are like 100% of the time, it's going to happen this way, or even like 99% of the time. It sounds great as far as like a sales pitch, but scientifically, it's a number that doesn't really have value. In fact, it actually makes you more alarmed mm. at the study that was done in order to come up with that kind of result. Mm. Ooh, Makes sense. Cool. Yeah. All right, everyone's cool. All right, so we're going to go into next topic. Do Christians threaten atheism? Brought to us by our own George Brown, the second and a half. George, would you mind talking to us about this topic real quick? What do you mean by do atheists threaten Christianity? Well, that, that's right. You, you, you got it wrong reverse. the first time. Yeah. <laughs> my bad, my bad, my bad. <laughs> okay, do atheists threaten Christianity? Well, um, there are a number of Christians who feel that they are... Um, they are being persecuted, and this this very this really puzzles me, you know, because I come from a background of people who really have been persecuted, and I, I don't know what these guys are talking about, but I think that maybe they they latch on to things to get outraged about, 
And when there is nothing to get outraged about, they, they manufacture something. So um, do we threaten them? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I, um, I, I get where you're coming from. And it's like, because Christianity and, you know, sort of the institutionalized religiosity um, has been really unchallenged for so long, uh, the increase in secularism is threatening the status quo. And I think that's just from my perspective is what the largesse of this whole um, persecution uh, uh, mentality is about. I could John, be wrong. What do you think? Is that me? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I hope atheism threatens Christianity. I hope it threatens Islam. I hope it threatens all of the religions, but I don't want it to threaten Christians. <laughs> what they have here is a persecution complex. Yes. They've taken ownership of an ideology. It's the yeah, ideology that we want to challenge, yeah. not them yeah. personally. They need to revise their attitude towards it. And what we're doing, as I see it, is teaching science and how to understand and discover reality. Mm -hmm. that's a good thing yeah um you know i i may think the inverse is true i would say uh we start off as atheists in my head and i don't see any other reason to believe in any other way it's it's christians that threaten atheism at every turn yes. of the corner because everyone starts off as an atheist are converted into christians when they're young before they have any developed critical thinking skills and then it's they're up to them for most for a lot of for a lot of people to work their way back to the default state of, of yeah. not only being back to an atheist if, if they can, but also developing a lack of fear of God, a lack of fear of death, critical thinking mm -hmm. skills, things that they should have had or were able to naturally develop if they weren't indoctrinated at such a young yes. age. Mm -hmm. uh, I found that to be more tragic. Well, oh. I think from, from what I've been seeing, um, there, you know, st statistics pop up in my life every once in a while that say, at least here within the United States, that uh, church membership has been dropping. Mm. And it's been dropping steadily for, you know, at least 10, 20 years, uh, you know, dropping at a significant rate. Although that's, I don't think that's the case with the fundamentalist people, you know, with, with the Baptists and the Baptist spinoffs um i guess centered around where i live here here in tennessee so i'm a bit puzzled larry would you mind touching in oh to me it, it threatens it uh because atheism shows that non-belief is an option like when i grew up nobody i knew was a non-believer right uh, until i got to college and once I found out that there were actual people who said, no, I don't believe it. And I have good reason for to not believe it is when I actually became a non-believer. Mm -hmm. So it threatens it in that way. Mm. Yeah. So uh, I was, uh, I was going to say when, you know, when the word conversion comes up, it's not, it's always converting to a religion. It's not converting to atheism, right? You, you can't convert to non-belief you have to convert into into right. a, a faith system right and yeah. i was also thinking that um you know while we talk about the decrease in the number of churches um which has you know is, is to, you know the, the the evidence is pretty clear of that but at the same time i think there's a consolidation of believers into larger and larger churches so that you know smaller chapels and stuff like that don't exist anymore because um as the as the singular voice of any religion starts to uh to dim and decrease somewhat they have to it's like there's a need for them now to gather in larger and larger centers in order to make more noise and, and build the confidence of their beliefs amongst each other sure. john well, I think you're right, Ty. I think that we're all born atheists. And what's been happening is they've been threatening us with their malicious rumors of hell and, and 
afterlife pain and all that sort of nonsense. Yeah. And, it's all part of it. And, and in order to try to protect their mythicism, what they've done is they've accused us of threatening them. It's a reversal. Mm -hmm. they, right. They've demonized us as the threat. It's right. nonsense. Yeah. Right, right, right. You know, it does come down to like, why is there that self-persecution? I feel like it's a easy thing to think of yourself as the underdog, right? In the grand scheme of things. But also religion has never been in the interest of making room for all the other different kinds of thoughts and dogmas in the world. It's always been a practice of monopolization. And yes. it's only now when we have like this global society where people can internationally travel and internationally communicate at an instant that you see religion begin to dwindle because it's its interest is in not keeping all the different kinds of bifurcations alive but rather making sure everyone sticks to a plan or some sort of single ideology but they can't get to terms with each other because they are you know in when you know, in their own ranks competing against each other but it's that's why you see these smaller churches like fall off to the wayside and i think that's leading to the diminishing numbers because people aren't subscribing to these larger store brand versions of religion they're just like ah oh, i guess i might as well just be doing my own thing be it's, an, it's, it's an irrational tri tribalism an mm. irrational tribalism because it's based on something which has no evidence to support its existence right right uh, it's a business that sells false hope <clears throat> what else can you say about it that is and it's the easiest commodity to give away it costs nothing but what, what's up dread well you know and that's and that's why uh one of the main reasons i I uh, identify as a pastafarian. Um, we're not a tribe. We're, you know, we don't have. We're, we're not ri rigid. We, uh, you know, we take ourselves lightly. Mm -hmm. And in terms of those unexplained aspects of uh, reality that there is no answer for, it serves as a suitable avatar um, that we can sort of point to, have some fun with. And at the same time, celebrate our own, um, our own uniqueness and, you know, this amazing universe. Um, so that's my defense of Pastafarianism. Yeah, yeah. And I guess that is true. It's not, it's, it's such a nuanced point to, to tie theism and religion in the same basket, but they are different things. Yeah. And I think in some aspects, certain religions are actually valuable and useful when you can, when you can handle them. And I think when you can handle them in a way where it doesn't harm critical thinking practices and like you can just really appreciate your community, that's fantastic. I also find that theism is just an invitation of accepting a bad model of reality because I have had conversations with Christians before who said, Tyrone, you don't think the truth is important because you don't believe in God. And I'm like, okay, so one, I don't think, I know where this is leading up because I've done conversations like this enough times where it's like objective truth is God. And that's why you think my, my truth is important because you think truth is God and therefore blah, blah, blah. But in my head, I've always found objective truth to be overrated because what's guided science is not the objective truth. It's what's useful, come up with a model for it and understand that it's just a model of reality. It's a work of fiction that we can pull useful truths out of. And the more that's useful right. it is, the that's better right. we can apply it to come up with better you know, systems and better mm -hmm. understandings of the universe. The objectivity okay. truth of it is not important at all. It's why we have Google Maps that has a flat 2D representation of the world. I know when I tap Nashville, my thumb's not going down and pushing Nashville into the dirt. I know it's a work of fiction. It's a model that I'm working with, but it's a useful model for me to drive up to Nashville if I need to. And mm -hmm. as long as I understand it as a work of fiction and pull the useful truths out of it, I can benefit from that. That's the concept yeah. of science. But religion is like a goat in a book, in my holy book told me not to steal things. I'm like, it didn't literally need to be a goat telling you that for it to not be a good idea to steal things. Like it still would be a bad idea to steal things, even if a magical goat or a magical bush or a dove on someone's shoulder or a guy who could resurrect from the dead told you not to do those things. Like you don't need the, the theatrics of it. Like there are some good morals in here that if you just appreciate it as a work of fiction could still be true. And I feel like because you've tied it in with this God complex, this theism complex, you just invited a really bad mechanic of, understanding what real is and what's not real and what's good and what's not good it's because it's yeah. unnecessarily true story or unnecessarily yeah. it's a barrier to discovery right <clears throat> right but, right right because once you have john. the answer you don't have to look anymore right yes. right 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 john what's up well you're absolutely right again who was it said that all models are wrong but some models are useful mm -hmm. 
He was some very wise person. But the, the only... Force... I think he was a pirate. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> the, the, only, the only false tribal religion that I think is harmless, apart from Pastafarianism, of course, is, um, what should we call Karmaianity. Ooh, Karma, Karmalism. <laughs> Karmalism. It is. Car <laughs> it sounds delicious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing a reverse segue. <laughs> they hate the sprinkle lights, though. They hate the sprinkle lights. You have to like pick a camp. You, my my life is caramelized. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It sprinkles all the way. Let's go. Um, Dread, did you have something to add to that? Just wanted to. No. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Ice cream all the way down. <laughs> Ice cream all the way down. Guys, uh, we have, speaking of science, did one. Oh, Until we get to the turtles. That's sure. right. <laughs> we got the show is also about the sciences i want to bring up um so we've had i've had an email discussion with some people uh who mail into the show i'll keep them anonymous i get a lot of requests that people would prefer to be anonymous that's totally fine but the comment that was made is that um u.s studies show that atheism or atheists are more unhappy than uh religious people or people who have religion in their lives and it was sort of a follow through comment from a previous email where we had conversations of how do atheists deal with stress and discipline. But uh, the, the counter argument based on our show from last week was that, well, everything you said sound reasonable. However, objectively speaking, U.S. studies show that atheists are less happy. And so isn't that a compelling argument that, you know, maybe religious people have figured something out, uh, something else? Out. And when I say religious, I literally mean theists and most like, well, I don't want to speak for the person. Anyway, Dred, saw your hand up. Did you have comments on uh, that? John was up first there. Okay, John, Thank what you. you got? Thank you. Well, I was going to say, I, I bet I know where that survey was conducted, but then you told us it was in the US. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I bet it wasn't conducted in Denmark. Which is, <laughs> it's a very happy country and almost nobody believes in any God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, yeah. I would think also that, uh, you know, it's, it's like one of my sons who believes in homeopathy and naturopathy. Uh, the placebo effect, while it might make you feel that good, you know, it doesn't really remove the underlying causes of your ills. Okay. Um, mm. You know, it just, yeah, if you're happy with the placebo effect, well, good for you. But um, it still puts you out of sorts with, uh, with the real world. Mm, mm, mm. Larry yeah. yeah I was just going to say that um, <clears throat> it has nothing to do whether it's true or not I mean you're happier uh, ha uh, what was I saw so the drunk man is happier than a sober man but it doesn't sure. mean that that's the way you should go yes um, like for the rest of your also, life right? Yeah, yeah. yeah right also if one religion makes you happier than no religion shouldn't you be on the track of which religion makes you the happiest and all very switch to good. that oh you know, it's, it's these not are, a very good argument larry you got it that was exactly what my point was going to be that's fantastic i was just going to cool. say so what you know mm -hmm. or as matt dillahunty would say so what because he loves those silent h's right what? yeah yeah what yeah. You know, it tell me all the atheists in the world are miserable, and I'd be like, that's still not a convincing argument, you know, to to be religious. Like right. it's it's yeah. always going to be the case that I will be convinced when there's a better argumentation or at least substantial evidence to prove that a god oh. exists, not whether or not it's more yeah. comfortable for me to believe in that god. You can't. I don't you care can't how happy it'll so. make me. I care yeah. if it's true. Yeah, you, <laughs> right. can't, you can't just exactly. say I'm happy, therefore God. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. And that is the sense. It's an argument from comfort, but it's basically, I'm happy. I heard statistically you weren't. Therefore, God. And you know, the weird thing is too, um, not to be, not to be even more paranoid than I am. However, I am aware of the fact that there is a, there is messaging within churches to say, make your appearance look like you have your stuff together because you don't wanna give us a bad look as a community because that's how we attract more people into our fold. And mm. so I know, for example, Mormons have very strict dictates on how you behave in society, how you're supposed to look, dress code, uh, matters of appearance, things that you like, music that's- Which cool. causes 
a huge amount of stress. Oh, definitely 24 yeah. seven. But if you talk to them, they're always <clears> smiling because <throat> they're, they have to, they have to, they have to. Muslims have the same thing too. I don't know if it's everywhere in every sect of Christianity. I mean, I've seen Presbyterians, but they seem more just like they're in an environment where like, that's just the culture. But I know, for example, Jehovah Witnesses also have very strict guidelines on how to behave yeah. and what, to, what they find acceptable. One of us, exactly. one of us, right. one of us. Yeah. So have... expanding, expanding on that idea, what we really need is a ranking system which puts religions in order of most happiness. <laughs> the one yep. at the top is going to be the most tolerant. It's going to allow most things, isn't it? And the one at the bottom, mm. that's probably, I don't know, Jainism or something, which yeah. is fairly permissive. But the one at the bottom is obviously going to be Islam, because you can't do <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're not allowed to do anything fun in mm. Islam. Yeah. Well... You know, that's a hard point to, to, to leave on. Um, you know, Jane is also, ha I would say Jainism is pretty rough too for a lot of people. I would imagine it'd be pretty rough. Uh, I don't think you can eat bacon as a Jainist either, right? Like, tell me something that a Jainist can do that an Islam person couldn't, that it, right? What's, what's the religion that emanated from Iran in reaction to Islam, which sort of mashes together the best bits of all the other religions i forget the name of it but it's uh, it, it's a pretty damn good religion <laughs> oh really okay okay, okay. Be, yeah i it might be the genes, i no? can't remember it there, there is a uh there is a so if we're talking about happy there's a religion called last thursdayism if you guys aren't familiar with this it's the idea yeah. that the universe was created last Thursday with all perceived memories just implanted into us. And so like, it really doesn't matter what's going to happen in the future, what's going to happen in the past. The universe only existed since last Thursday. So Hakuna Matata, you know, like just, hey, it doesn't matter so much in the grand scheme of things. Just have good time this week because that's it. Hey, what's up, George? Oh, you're on mute, my friend. He's sort of the, the name of the religion. Baha'i Baha is what you're thinking of. I think. That's it. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Thanks, George. George remembered something that none of us could remember in this show. So yeah. that's, that's that because, well, that's because I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area for a long time. The yeah, Baha'i exactly. people have, have a large presence there. Yeah. I just couldn't remember the name. Yeah. Uh, Dred, do you have anything you'd like to say before you close out the show? uh yeah i was gonna say something but uh, i got sidetracked okay where can we find your stuff at uh well i am on uh youtube uh on my channel mind pirate m-i-n-d-p-y-r-a-t-e and i record this live at 7 a.m pacific daylight time every sunday morning fantastic and you got also also global on. atheist news review uh at 11 a.m pacific daylight time so uh please check it out and if you like it subscribe and ring the bell hey dread let me ask you a question you're setting up that studio is that going to be for future scientific conversations that you'll yes. have in front of the camera yes. what's that about um well uh, the i've already said that i'll be talking about the uh the higgs boson on a sort of a layman level um just so that people can have a better understanding of some of these uh more complex uh scientific concepts that they haven't um you know haven't yet taken a, a deeper dive into so i look forward to uh producing some uh, content here in the very near future i can be found at let's chat on uh youtube uh i'm really shocked i still got that youtube screen name but uh for the most part i'm having fun time just uploading these videos and uh thank you guys so much for paying attention to the show we have really really long-term fewer engagement on our channels we get about a couple hundred but everyone watches the show for at least 40 minutes and that wow, is cool. very unnatural as far as youtube goes so like thank you guys for the long attention span i think it's yeah. useful to produce long form content that people watch from more or less beginning to end each time and 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 just sort of like curb this sort of you know lack of attention span that we seem to be yeah. culturing yeah. on this no, they're all sleeping, they're sleeping. <laughs> anyway uh john richards where can we find your stuff at I'm at Free Thought Productions YouTube channel, and um, as uh, already been trailed, I do Global Atheist News Review with a couple of you reprobates later on today. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I don't actually live stream it myself because I want to do some editing, 
but uh, yeah, Dred, you put it out live. I think somebody else puts it out live too, which is fine. It's all about getting seen, not about purity of content or even production values. And um, I also do a free thought hour. I did a lovely free thought hour last night with a l delightful lady from South Africa, Tercia Duplessis, who is a critical thinking teacher. She is well worth watching. And of course, then there was Global Atheist News, which is the, the parent of the review, which is also up on my site to be seen. This will be later too. I said, Ben has a critical thinking teacher. That's so good. Yeah, how can okay. I do that? I just want to say uh, happy Mother's Day. It's uh, Mother's Day. Yep, that's true. Very happy Mother's Day. Everybody. And I just wanted to show off a bowl uh, that I turned on my wood lathe. Ooh, I mentioned that. Oh, that looks great. I've just what? started doing This is maple uh, ah. with, with mm. spalting, which is the coloration is in there. And that's fungus that gets into the grain. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, 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 my mom is a is a Christian, so um, I can't say Happy Mother's Day because she won't watch this. But I say it to all the other atheists and uh, pastafarian mothers out there. Same here. My mom's a Jehovah's Witness, but we still love them all the same. What can you yeah, say? Right. Uh, and I'll call her after this show. So, uh, Larry, anything that you'd recommend that we check out? And uh, feel free to close up. Well, I'd, I'd say if you're a member of the clergy, but have come to see that the claims of religion are just not justified and you've lost your faith, but stuck in uh, the pulpit, as it were, uh, check out the Clergy Project. There's help for you there. It's clergyproject.org is the website. My content can be found at digitalfreethought.com. Be sure to click on the blog button for our radio show archives, Atheist Songs, and many articles on the subject of atheism. My YouTube channel can be found at Doubter5 or Larry Rhodes. And uh, my book, Atheism, What's It All About, is on Amazon. You can find this show as, as a podcast on Apple iTunes, Pocket Cast, Amazon, or Podcasts Anywhere. Just search for Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Thank you for joining us. Remember, if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. And remember also that everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life, and we'll see you next week. Say bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.